Uh, I was in charge of mobile. I had project funding from Konami for doing Nintendo DS, um, and in addition to Microsoft Casual Games for doing the mobile version. So that's essentially where I started um, my career, um, you know, doing gaming in Korea. Uh, then I got poached by Viacom, which is a competitor of Liberty Media, um, to take over the Virtual World Group uh, out of Singapore. So I moved down to Singapore, and I've been there eight, for eight years. Uh, but at Viacom, I took care of the MTV brands, Nickelodeon, uh, in addition to uh, Comedy Central. I was in charge of all products digitally, so from licensing SpongeBob to launching um, apps, publishing apps. So I would actually go around different markets and look at apps that would fit into the Viacom brands like Nickelodeon and license them and get them published. Um, and the question that you're asking, I think, oh, well, the person left, the monster truck guy, how do you get featured? Well, being a big company does matter. Um, I was sat on the app council for, uh, for Viacom, and Apple employees basically would sit there and ahead of time, maybe about two months ahead of time, exactly what Janda said, provide us with specs, and we would basically build our games based on that and get featured. Uh, so there's an advantage of being uh, a big player in the market and getting, getting the attention from, from folks like Apple and, and Google. Uh, then I moved on to Samsung, and I took her there. I was a, a strategy head there, looking after services like Milk Music. If you guys probably saw PR releases in the US, Australia, where I helped with the licensing and, and getting the app up and running. Um, also, as a strategist of Samsung, I looked at all the KPIs and the metrics that's required to get you know, our app successful in the marketplace, in addition to uh, monetization for Samsung. Um, and for Samsung, their app play was stickiness. How do I get more consumers or loyal consumers to buy more phones and, and keep them with the ecosystem? So at Samsung, I took care of strategy and that. And ironically enough, you know, we subscribed to App Annie. And a lot of the tricks that Junda had talked, uh, we, we maximized it. We looked at the, you know, App Annie quite often and, and looked at categories, keywords, in which people don't invest in. Um, and having a, a deep pocket allowed us to basically get ranking. Uh, whenever we needed to. So that's just my background. Um, I'm with Akamai today doing, as a chief strategist, um, you know, giving industry insights uh, in categories like digital media, entertainment, and video. Um, I did a lot of OTT work, obviously, at Viacom, uh, launching their first um, music service, um, both for the video platform and, and on, on audio. Uh, as you might have heard, heard brands of Rhapsody. So that's my background. And uh, just a quick background of Akamai and, and uh, what we do, we basically deliver 30% of the world's internet. Um, the reason for that is our servers are placed in 2,000 locations, um, and we're a content delivery network, essentially. If you guys know what that is, um, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, from early stage to growth stage and why a CDN is probably required at a later time. But that's what we are today. And we started in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1998, um, was established, and you know, we're now a $14 billion market cap size company. Uh, but a lot of the insights I'm providing is coming from my startup background, um, going to corporate, and also working with a lot of startups, you know, while I was in, in, in a corporate uh, position. Just kind of allowed me to give provide insights to actually allow you to, you know, grow, sustain, and look at metrics that kind of matter. And, and look at some of the stuff that the VCs actually do care about. So, the SaaS market. Um, SaaS works relatively fast. Uh, folks in here, um, how many people ha are entrepreneur today? Raise your hands. Okay, how many are doing SaaS? Okay, not a whole lot, but just to give you an overview really quick of what the SaaS market is, you guys don't know, um, it's really software on demand. Software in the past has, has been, you know, a piece of code that sits on your PC laptop when it's downloaded. Um, and you actually pay it, and you basically keep that software on, us, on, on, your, on your PC or your mobile phone in the past. Um, and that's changed. So on-demand uh, services is, is basically what, what we see today. And um, in, in app stores, contents like Netflix, you know, it's still considered a SaaS because it's sitting on top of the cloud infrastructure. In addition to that, people actually think of subscription-based business models because that's what you know people are used to and I'll, I'll cover that a little bit on how how you know when you design 
you know, SaaS models or how people design SaaS models and, and looking at that business model in terms of how you do subscription-based versus freemium, making that decision um, on a time. Work across all devices. Um, how many hold, people hold two devices in their pocket today? Like how many phones do you guys have? Two. Right. You know, people, expectation in, in the digital space today is that, you know, all your software works across all devices. Um, fourthly, customer service. Um, you know, soft, you know, SaaS stands for software as a service. They expect customer service. Uh, being able to engage with customer service rep and be able to, you know, feedback, connect, interlink, um, ask any questions. If there's any service issue, be able to raise that and have that address relatively quickly. The last thing is, you know, people think of it just something in the cloud. Uh, the, word, the buzzword cloud is, is kind of thrown around and, and, you know, when you talk about as a service, everything's in the cloud. So just, oh, sorry about that. So the SaaS market is growing relatively quickly, and I'm providing you data based on you know the enterprise market space. Um, you know we're, you know so software is seven percent growth. You're looking at cloud eighteen percent. You're looking at SaaS twenty percent. What's causing all this? Um, it's really the ease of fact that people can, you know, get on the cloud relatively quickly and build software on top of that. Enterprises have, in, in the past, been really afraid to use the cloud services because of various reasons, like security. Uh, because that's kind of changing, and you know, a lot of services that are building software on top of cloud are actually you know, dealing with this and addressing those issues, it's not so much a problem anymore. Um, and you can see down here, you know, those, the, the, blue, the blue here, let me see if there's, yep. This is basically the conversion between going to cloud versus on-premise type software. Um, whether it's installing your servers or, or using it, you can see that it's getting roughly about to um, close to 40% to 50% adoption from companies today. So if you're in a B2B space and selling you know, a software as a service to, to uh, B2B vendors, in the past, there's a lot of pushbacks. The reason why is a lot of traditional companies have a lot of legacy software that they've built or invested in that they don't want to integrate with, ultimately. In addition to the fact that there might be security flaws that, that may impact the business. Um, we all heard about the breaches of the various big companies that I can't mention, but you know, we, we, talked, you know, we talked about security. You know, having your user information, including your employee information, is vital. When you're ever building a software as a service, you, know, you have to think about some of, that, some of that aspect of it you were selling B2B. For B2C, you know, we're having all these privacy uh, policies all kicking in. You know, Singapore kicked it off probably two years ago. Malaysia is you know, looking into that. So when, when you're looking at software services, it's all about looking at security and things of that nature, that, that the reason for people to use cloud and trust it. But given the proliferation of handsets, everybody's used to using apps on phones now, and they're a lot more uh, easygoing in terms of like, signing up to services that you know, have access to your user information, ultimately. You know, if you're, if you're an entrepreneur now or looking to get into the business, um, I'm just giving you data to look at what market and what's, what you know, the size looks like. Um, just in Asia Pacific alone, uh, we're looking at, you know, $6 billion, $7 billion moving 2019. It's a huge market space. This information right here is based on IDC, and really I'm look, probably looking at just more software as a service. But if you're talking about like companies like App Annie who built on top of that, you'll probably see a bigger market share uh, in, the, in this area. We can see the growth here that you know, software as a service is, is here to stay, and, and you know, B2B and B2C customers are, are now are accustomed to basically uh, paying for services. So the, the global market size here, um, you're looking at about 112 billion. So you can see there's a lot of room to play here. So, the, the, com the word that you know, a lot of people don't use in this industry is the third platform. The third platform essentially is what SaaS is today in terms of like services like Netflix, Twitter, Dropbox. They're building on top of the cloud, um, leveraging that infrastructure and getting you know, um, a service that's available you know, online 24-7 at any point in time. Uh, obviously, connectivity can be an issue in countries that, um, that, that have bad network connect connectivities, but you know, as an app developer in, in countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, um, some parts of Malaysia, I think you guys address that in a very good way. But you can see here, you know, when we talk about how the eras of platform development, this is where the mainframe era started. You know, there's only probably thousands of apps. 
The middle layer is probably, you know, the generation of PC, where a lot of people, you know, download applications onto their PCs. You probably have tens and thousands of apps. Um, we, you know, who uses a PC today? Who uses a Chromebook? I just want to get a raise of hands of people who use Chromebook. Does anybody use Chromebook? One? No. If everything's on the cloud, everything's interconnected, and, and there's a common layer. And what all these companies have done in this area, the third platform area, is built a common platform in, where, in which people can just um, have access to their service on any devices. So you see the growth here. Um, a lot of areas in the third platform uh, play would be IoT. Things on IoT um, has a big growth area. Um, in addition to uh, interface, natural interfaces, um, using hand gestures, eye movement, you know, th things that things are being heavily invested in this area. And that's, that's a big area of growth. Um, folks that raise your hand as entrepreneur, can I ask a question? What type of business are you guys running? Are you guys running a consumer business or targeting B2B? Um, consumer? Uh, and what, do, what is one of, one of your, what does your service do today? Travel, okay. So with that kind of being said, I, you know, I, I did cover a lot of the consumer aspect of, of, of the metric systems today so that I can, um, I can better suit you guys. Because we do a lot of um, B2B at Akamai, so I'm covering kind of between B2B and, and B2C. So this is really the last game of cloud today. You're seeing thousands and thousands of companies quickly be able to evolve and get on the platform quickly and provide a service. So I'll just jump, quickly jump into key SaaS metrics um, in terms of you guys build a service, because some of you guys already probably have taken uh, the crash courses today or, or yesterday. And you know, from my perspective and my past gaming experience, I kind of want to kind of address what I see as key metrics and what VCs look at in addition to, you know, as a business owner, you probably have your own metrics that you measure that typically aren't standard. And that's probably key for entrepreneurs. You need to understand your business and be able to measure you know, the exact things that impact your business. So we, we hear of like probably four to five metrics that you know, SaaS companies or even, even business owners um, who are running applications. You know, cost per acquisition, monthly recurring revenue, engagement, DAUs. Um, uh, but the, what I kind of broke down is the different stages that you should start using those metrics and that's impactful and helpful to you. If you're looking at the early stages, you know, we talked about cost per acquisition. You're on a budget. You know, when I was at Samsung, it was very different for me to be able to throw money in the market, go chase the, the ranking. But that, that's one of the things that you would have to manage very well is figuring out cost per acquisition and looking at the different channels you use. One's bartering. You know, bartering with people like, uh, with local media companies that can actually help you push your application out to, out to market. Another is monthly recurring revenue. Uh, revenue is important. Um, one of the things that I, I kind of saw when you actually launch a new app, you wouldn't technically go free right away. Um, I actually think that having a premium version available for a customer allows you to quickly look at whether or not your product actually fits the market and if there's actually people willing to pay for it. Um, in gaming, that's why we go with the freemium model where you have free to play, but there's actually ability to buy virtual currencies to monetize, monetize the game. And, and it provides a good feedback loop of saying, okay, wait, I provide a minimal viable product out on market. Are people willing to pay for this? Next is engagement. Engagement are things like DAU, MAUs. Tracking user behavior in early stage, we're putting on an app for tests, for beta, gives you a good sense of you know, whether or not the features that you want the customer to use are being used. Things that you're providing the users are actually being um, you know, time spent on. The time spent is, is another aspect of things that is a part of engagement that I think that um, is kind of left out because you know, you're, you're so busy looking at metrics. If you're doing mobile apps, you're looking at downloads. Right? You're looking at uh, active users that you know, log in and stuff like that. But the time spent actually provides you a good sense of whether or not your product's actually sticky. Then the product feedback. You know, throwing surveys out in your services, um, providing whether it's online surveys, whether it's on the ground, 
setting up a stand at Starbucks and say, hey, look, you, you know, I'll give you a cup of coffee if you want. Can you test out my app and give me feedback? Those are the four metrics that I would look at at an early stage to kind of figure out whether or not your product's actually going to succeed. Um, iteration is probably needed because the fact that you have a leap of faith, that fact that whatever you're building will work. And, you know, technically, that's not the case. There's rounds of iteration that's required. Hence why I kind of left out things like, um, you know, CLV. But if you're in early stage and CLV is something that you want to track, your cost per acquisition is going to be greater than your customer lifetime value, right? And if you guys don't know what customer lifetime value is, it's really a mechanism of looking at your revenue um, and, and the stickiness of your, of, your, of your service and projecting it outwards. So a good example is you know, subscription um, services. Everybody has mobile services. Um, raise of hand, who's postpaid? Okay. Telcos can actually measure your customer lifetime value. The reason why, there's re recurring revenue every month for allow them to project you know, whether or not you're going to stay with them or not. And it gives you a good indication. Moving on to transition stage, you know, once you get out of the stage, you're actually seeing traction, and you're able to provide a decent enough product that you're seeing pretty good feedback. These are the metrics I would look at. Customer acquisition would be number one. Monthly recurring revenue again. Again, you want to make sure there's ability that there's a business model behind it. Whether it's, whether it's ads, whether it's, whether it's uh, subscription, MRR is typically around subscription, right? Or, or even potentially in-app purchases, but I would look at subscription. And then, again, again, engagement. Looking at all the items and engagements that, you know, from DAUs to uh, MAUs to time spent, features adopted. Because, for example, you may have two feature sets here. Move on here, you might have five features. Are users using those features? And those are key things to actually move on looking at the growth stage. By the time you get to growth stage, you know, you'll be looking at you know, various things that you want to keep table stake, which means are, you know that these are my key value propositions that I want to give the users and, and what they're paying for, essentially. Last thing is churn. So when you're transitioning from early stage to growth stage, churn starts to sort of matter. Now, it's a different type of churn because churn is typically a user you know, that you know, from my, from my definition, is a paying user. Um, obviously, you want all users to be active, have an account with you guys, and not get off your platform. But, you know, at this stage, it's probably a good time to start tracking it because you probably did a lot of experimentation here, started acquiring some customer, ramping up, getting to, to, to a, a nice, steady, linear curve. I would start looking at churn. But at this stage, ignore it. All you're looking at is customer growth, product better, and then iterating it to, to, to a point where it's, you know, I would say, showtime. And, you know, it's between here and here that I would say it's, it's the most important where you get your product right and you know what you're selling to your, to your customer. And right here, your CPA and CLV may be the same. If users are start, start actually paying, this will probably be, you know, cancel out because the amount of investment you have here and, and the amount that you're, you're, you're getting customer lifetime value, you start seeing enough sample size. For example, if you're early stage for like three months, you know, by the time you get here, you'll probably have six months worth of data to actually look at you know, cu uh, customer lifetime value. So going on to growth. Um, similarly, but I would actually reverse the ranking. Revenue is actually gonna be very important. Um, this is where, you know, between here and here, depending on where you get your seed round, um, if, it's, if it's early, Sorry. With seed round, you know, it's going to be very important to kind of, kind of uh, figure out what you are telling investors. Am I earning any revenue? Investors like the fact that you're generating revenue early on. It, it proves to them that you, you actually you know, have a product that people are willing to pay for. Second, you know, cost per acquisition, and then engagement. It's something that always needs to be measured. Um, you know, a lot of times you're going to go into other different metrics. I always look at the reoccurring revenue for SaaS models. Um, but engagement is probably the best thing that will actually provide a fee. And then churn. At this probably, at the growth stage, you're probably looking at obviously CPA, hopefully getting less than customer lifetime value. 
Um, but again, customer lifetime is a forecast. It's going future, right? How sticky is the customer? You know, are they going to be coming back? Are you willing to pay? And that's all the information you're getting. Um, what I call CL, uh, customer lifetime indicators. Um, a lot of those metrics that you see all that were all number driven. Now, there are aspects of it, you know, coming from gaming, what I call service levers. The engagement aspect of the customer lifetime value is probably something that in early stage is so important because you're, you kind of want to look at the consumer's behavior and pattern. Um, going back to media, gaming, health, fitness, travel, lifestyle, productivity, and social, there's various things that you can look at as customer lifetime indicators. Whether or not these customers feel that your service is sticky. You know, I'll look at gaming given the fact that I, you know, I come back from gaming. You know, levels completed, consumables, meaning that, you know, power-ups, energy bars, whatnot, time played. These are great. So what do you do with this information? You can actually create service levers to actually create additional stickiness uh, with, with your service by level unlock stages, extra life, rewards. And you're now basically almost having an engagement that's two-way. The engagement that we measure typically are saying, are the users doing stuff that I want them to do? Well, this is a form of reward to actually create a stickier customer, customer lifetime value. Although these are not number driven, they can be. By keeping the, the users in your platform longer, you probably can create uh, more long-term stickiness. And these are some of the categories I'm going through. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but um, you can read here on, on things that I, I, I used to use in customer lifetime value in gaming. There's a downside for customer lifetime value. I mentioned early on that it's kind of hard to tell and calculate customer lifetime value um, because people have choices. I give you utilities. I give you something that's, you know, a necessity in, li in, in today's life, but you can change. You have options to change. Utilities. Utilities are something that we need, power, things that we pay for, water, bill, whatnot. If we think about building our products in the method where it's a necessity, you actually create that stickiness and that customer lifetime value actually becomes reality. But to calculate customer lifetime value when you don't have that necessity, that stickiness, you know, what am I addressing? What is the pain point of my consumer today that I'm addressing that won't make them leave? and continue to pay for versus, you know, prepaid to postpaid. I can jump to any carrier I want to at any point in time. It's a necessity, but I have alternatives. So when you think about products and building that products, you want to create that stickiness. And, and, and I, keep, I use the word stickiness because you don't measure customer lifetime value if it's not sticky. So other, other means of doing that, going back to that engagement, frequency. Customer lifetime value, you know, you don't know what the frequency is. So, for example, people, how many people use Spotify here and pay for it? That's fantastic. That's a pretty good percentage. Uh, Spotify, you have two plans. You have a monthly plan and you have an annual plan. If I opted for an annual plan, you automatically f assume that I'm actually using the service because I paid you for 12 months. But tech, you know, if I only paid on a monthly basis, the frequency is missing. So frequency is something that I believe that's a qualitative measurement that can actually turn quantitative because things like usage. Do they intend to use the service that you want them to? Spotify is enjoy music, listen to music. It's really one value proposition you get. But if you're, if you're talking about other services that you might have in the market, you might not have that, that same type of... Um, that's that same type of um, pattern. Time, how long, how often? So tracking those type of stuff you know, will allow you to kind of cater your product in. Going back to your product, build a, build a good product. Conversions, you know, are they converting? Login, intervals, how often, how many times a day? Is it, if it's a productivity tool, how many times do I log into Evernote every day? Do I stay logged in forever? You know, those are the, those are the things you want to measure. Better customer service. So all the stuff that I'm going after talking about those metrics is how to create that customer lifetime value and how to create that stickiness. Loyalty. What does better customer service do for you? Increases 
could potentially increase revenue? Can you address a customer's need uh, based on their feedback? Retention equal loyalty. You know, that's, that's essentially why you have airlines having loyalty systems retentions, because they want to keep track of you and what you're doing. So, you know, it, it's the fact that I know that you're using us, and I can keep track of it and reward you for that and make sure that you stay, stay with our carrier. Creates a feedback loop. Um, you know, Amazon has a really nice pop-up window when you have issues with your, uh, with your purchasing. You know, it, you know that, those are things that you should think about. Um, people who have live services already, do you guys use Zendesk? Yeah. How, what do you think of Zendesk? It's all right? In, in, what, in, in what way? Do you leave it on 24-7 or do you, do you keep it as, as and when? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know, products like Zendesk will actually allow you to create that you know, feedback loop because you can actually talk to a customer and be able to get that stuff back. So having a good customer service is something that's important in, in a SaaS model. Uh, in today's era, we're in a service-based economy. Having a great customer service team, um, in my analogy, in gaming, we have great community managers. Community managers in gaming are, are treated like customer service because they talk to the users, get the feedback, and then make changes on the production side. Upsell opportunities. You know, if you're able to engage your customers and your customer service will upsell new services or introduce new services, better for you. More stickiness. Improved service and products. All right. Meeting customer expectations. I mean, you know, again, building product. These are elements that when you build a SaaS service that, you know, we tend to forget because we're, we're grilled in on fixing things and making sure. But look at the ease of use, you know, the flow. Is it easy to sign up? Ease of use. Purchase as a service, right? As a cus consumer, I purchased something from you. It's, it's a service now. It's no longer just a product I could take away. It's something that's live. Real-time engagement. Can I get help? Going back to the Amazon analogy. Build value. So this is where all leads back to going back to the SaaS analogy saying, what are the components you need to actually measure those metrics properly? Those metrics are kind of thrown out there to say, hey, these are things you need to measure, but what do you do to, to make sure you have data to measure, <laughs> right? So build value, increase stickiness by, you know, value prop proposition plus pricing strategy. You know, um, you don't want to, you know, a lot of things people expect in SaaS is it should be cheap. That's not always necessarily true. If you provide a kick-ass product, you can charge higher. Whether it's B2B, whether it's B2C. Um, you know, App Annie, you have a kick-ass product. He talks about, you want to know about the information? It's behind the paywall. <laughs> but they actually have a kick-ass service, which means that, you know, the pricing could be actually higher because there's higher benefit. Um, so these are takeaways in terms of looking at your product, tweaking them, treating your business today in, in, in the SaaS world as a service. You know, think of a, the analogy I always use is the hotel business. It's always up and running 24-7. If I'm up at 3 a.m., I can call the concierge and provide that type of level of service. You know, so your customer success squad, when they actually measure all these, like, different things that are happening, you know, it's, it's also making sure you nudge. You have to nudge your consumer sometimes to figure out whether or not, they're, you know, using your product the way that they should be using it and find out about services that they don't know about. So a lot of, uh, you know, today I kind of walked around, um, kind of figure I did pull out a lot of slides um, based on B2B because I saw a lot of B2C type interests. But the difference between selling B2B and B2C um, is kind of laid out here. In acquisition, um, in a B2B marketplace, it's much smaller. You're actually targeting a, a smaller amount of companies to go after. Whereas in the B2C, that's the wild, wild west for you. You know, you're, you're talking about ma a massive like, user base. You're talking about games where you're targeting almost everyone that has a handset. You know, you're, you're a mass network, much more difficult. Uh, in B2B, you also rely on personal network. A lot of people that we hire in B2B space, Akamai is primarily a B2B business, have really strong network, meaning they have good relationship with people that they're selling to already. 
and, and that's used to basically get the deals done. Here, you know, it's word of mouth. You know, you have friends that encourage you that you're actually building your own, your own business, and I, you know, applaud you guys for this. And those are the people that will provide you guys that network effect. The problem with this is that you have a lot more people to reach. So that's one of the challenges in selling between a B2B and a B2C for SaaS. Sales cycle. B2B is typically longer. You know, if you're selling to corporations, they have policies, processes to actually sign up on budget. Whereas B2C can be shorter, depending on what you're providing them in, in terms of service. If it's the same service, like a productivity tool that both work in B2B and B2C space, in a B2B space, it's typically cheaper, right? In addition to the fact that, you know, um, your, your consumers are using it at home and they might be using it, you know, um, you know, for themselves, whereas in a, in a B2B situation, I might bring seats, like user seats. How many, how many employees do I have in a company? I might be by 30 in bulk. So there's a lot more decision that has to be made versus you know, one to many. Business model. The typical business model that you guys would typically look at you know, in B2B would be annual commit and usage base. B2C, subscription, usage base, or just one off. Um, the B2B space, because it's you know, looking at annual commit models typically, when you go back to the customer lifetime value, it's easier to calculate. Like I mentioned earlier, when you're looking at Spotify in the consumer space, you have month to month versus annual. If you have annual, you know that I have this user for 12 months, whether or not they use me or not, I can calculate what their lifetime is. Um, and you better hope that within that 12 months, they're highly engaging your service. If not, they're gonna churn. Support level. You know, if your business is looking at B2B, um, you're doing travel, but I can make an assumption that you potentially may go into a B2B space one day. Service level agreements. Your service level has to be much higher than what you provide to consumers. The great thing about this wave of the startup is the fact that you're looking at um, consumer bases that, consumer bases that um, look, are reading your articles or PR. And they kind of, you know, it's good enough, I'm going to try it. If customer service is great, Fantastic, you know, it, it's, it's good to know. If it's not so great, I understand, you guys are a startup. But it's not so for, forgiving in the B2B space. So those are big differences between selling to B2B and B2C. Um, and I bring up B2B because it's, it's an exciting space. I mean, Junda, are, would you guys be consider B2C or B2B? B, right? Right. It's an exciting space. And you know, it's, it's actually a much more narrow focus approach of, of getting your business off the ground if you guys want Want, want to look at this space. Um, it's a natural progression because if, if your business is, um, other than like maybe the entertainment side of, the, uh, of um, services, it's a natural progression. How am I on time? Sorry, anybody, how am I on time? Okay. So looking at Growth Station Beyond, um, you know, kind of going to look at those metrics, looking at the various, um, things that you can do to basically create a, a good product in addition to make sure that you know, you're, you're service-minded. SaaS success, not easy. Only over 7% of companies make it and have 10,000 users, let alone. What are the reasons for that? Um, you look at these you know, early stage, it's all acquisition primarily, and the amount of time, you know, the years in here without any churn. You'll get to a point where you start reaching that saturation. I think in the app space, you know, um, even, even my learnings, both from Viacom and Samsung. Viacom, I had branded content. At Samsung, not branded. It was targeted only for Samsung users. I still had a lot of challenges in the sense that I started reaching a growth state. I can't dump in more money, right? Because the fact that if the users are, are churning and, and not using my service, I'm not doing something correct. So these are things that you start thinking about. You know, is it my performance, scalability, reliability, security? You know, and, and it's really things that it's get, it gets neglected a lot, uh, especially in startup space in Asia, because they think about just one thing, users, 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 and then monetization. But they forget about a lot of the fact that you need to be able to scale and have that quality of service um, in order for you to do that. Um, based on surveys that we got from the Cloud Trend surveys in, in 2014, why the SaaS adoptions are slow in the B2B space, um, 
security performance availability. With the recent security you know, blunders that have happened that you actually caught on the web you know, in the recent uh, few weeks, you know, a lot of consumers are now concerned about you know, what happens if you know, I buy something online and I have all my user information there, what if it gets breached? Do I trust you know, the services? We're all used to the digital world now. Everybody has credit cards, everybody buys things online. So we're used to it, we're, you know, we're adapted to it. But the concerns kind of lies in your head. And that's where, you know, as a business, it's your responsibility to provide that trust. Um, even a SaaS model, there's now a trust level now. In the past, when you had download to PC, non-network connected applications, you didn't have to worry about that, right? It sits on your PC, if you have your information there, the only way that it gets hacked is if your computer's network's connected, right? But the application itself, you don't have to worry about that. That's not a customer support thing that you have to worry about. Today, security is something you have to think about. In addition to performance, you know, imagine you have your servers based in Malaysia and you were to go global. You know, like, well, yeah, it's, it makes sense for me to build a hosting service in the US, but if you're a startup, you may not have that ability to do so from a, from a finance standpoint. So thinking about that stuff um, early on, it, it's key. Because when you're asking the VCs, I need to get, I'm gonna scale, how much of that money that they give you is gonna go to infrastructure? Common challenge is growth, again, you know, growth stage is customer acquisition again, user experience, operational efficiency. These three things keep people up at night when they get past that growth stage. Um, I remember, you know, I was lucky enough to get out of the Series A um, at GoPets, but the biggest challenge I had um, was the fact that we were growing so fast into various markets. We had too, so many partners that we'd handle. You know, the investment that we got um, from, from the various investors 80% of it went to infrastructure, to scale. We started off in Korea. We went from Korea to 10 markets in the same year. And a lot of this stuff started falling through the cracks in, in terms of like performance, security, and things of nature. We looked at markets that had the potentials and we, we kind of patched things up to make sure it worked. Um, you know, in, in gaming, we had community service managers, so we, we get feedbacks right away. He goes, by the way, your service is down. Okay, what do I do, reboot, reboot the server? So. Three things, scalability and availability. Those are the things you have to think about when you get past the growth stage. So, again, going back to, you know, it's a little bit repetitive, but I'm drilling into your head to think about what are your consumers thinking about? As a business, you know, is my application available at all times? It's expected these days, right? I paid for a service, it should be available. The one thing that irked me about Spotify, I'm gonna say it out loud, if anybody's from Spotify's here, then they can hear me. I paid for the service early on, um, and I, you know, the service was fine back then. They started to launch a freemium version, which is basically ad-supported. In my head, if I'm paying for a service, I expect availability for, for, the, for my content, or the content I'm accessing. Um, but they didn't have that differentiation. They didn't think about whether or not you know, the, the freemium aspect of it would actually impact premium users. It did. They got more users to come onto the platform, and the fact that I'm waiting to connect sometimes to, to the Spotify network irks me. Performance, you know, again, um, going through that performance, it's, it's making sure you have the right equipment, the right hosting, the right, you know, content delivery network. What, you know, whether you have all that in place, you know, when you have your service up and running, it's key. You have Zendesk in place to make sure your customer service needs are in tape. You know, you need all these other tool sets to actually help your business and make sure you have that in place, not just hosting. Security. You know, how are you guys protecting the customer's information today? You know, um, a lot of times people, uh, engineers, developers, I, I, I manage a development team. Um, a lot of them are pressured to get products out relatively quickly. What happens? This gets neglected. Um, you know, I was working at MTV, um, you know, we had our world stage here every year. Um, two year you know, I left MTV two years ago, but we had one year we got hacked. And the rationale behind that was we were rushing to get out a, a development or a product and totally forgot to patch all this. You know, whether or not things are alias, whether or not mask, and you know, the recent breach that I can't talk about, I can't bring the name up, they didn't have any of the name masked. You know, that stuff, that information is out there, 
and people can actually get access to it. And then expertise. Do you have the expertise to, to have that? Getting people on your team that has a bit of that experience will take you a long way when you're past that growth stage. So buyer's top concerns is vendors. So if you're selling to B2Bs, that's probably more, more likely so. But B2C, with the, reach, the recent activities with, with security, you know, you've got to think about this stuff now. Again, scale, performance, intelligence. You know, those sort of things to think about. Does your product work across devices? It's expected, right? You know, um, user feedback loop. You know, what type of information are you gathering, the right information? Again, you guys know your business best. VCs look at those key metrics that I kind of pointed out earlier, but you know, I think Jenna talked about VCs love active users. It's true. But you also have to make sure that you know the metrics that you want to measure because, again, you know your product best. And if your product is not addressing those needs, pivot. You know, that's, the, that's the thing that you have to think about, pivot. You know, never be afraid to change directions quick enough before you launch a product because you don't want to give your users a poor experience. So, you know, just wrap up. Key takeaways, um, you know, build products that meet the market needs. You know, what is the value proposition that you're, you're building for your consumers or to a, to a business that you're selling to? Product market fit. Second, metrics and tracking are important for growing because if you don't know what your consumers are doing, are they using your product correctly? You know, the investors care about it, right? They want to know whether or not your, your product is sticky. Third, performance, reliability, you know, security. They're key to scale and growth. I mean, these are things that you should have in your mind now, and I, you know, I brought this up because it's past growth stage. And lastly, make customer service forefront because the as a service really does mean that we're in a service economy, and you guys are all customer service representatives because that's essentially what you're doing today is making sure that your customers are satisfied at all times. I'll just wrap it up here. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I just wonder, from your info, uh, if let's say uh, for a startup, for a corporate corporate companies, mm -hmm. let's say they want to use one apps or software, uh, they only use Apple. I mean, the app just use the Apple. <laughs> they cannot use other mobile uh, like Samsung. Uh, the application is only used by Apple, like. Uh, iPad Air only, uh, because the company is only a, uh, they just launch uh, the thing. Eh? As you say, start up lah. It's only a trial. They get all the users to use. Is there any implication uh, if uh, if the user only you can use high end? You know, Apple is a high end uh, mobile. That means other user who holding Samsung they cannot use. Is there any impact on that? Lah? Um, I mean, it depends. I mean, we t let's say you built an enterprise software suite, and you're you're selling to businesses. Um, the one thing that you're looking at, if if one company has Apple only, you probably have a suite that just supports Apple. Um, B two B, you know, you have the acquisition, but you're actually selling to companies. You're not you're not selling to individual consumers, which is why the metrics are slightly different in terms of how you address that, right? If you're talking about scale, it's how many companies I, I brought in, and it's your MRR right from the bat. Right from day one, you'll be looking at your MRR. You might do a free trial here and there, but right from day one, I think you look at MRR. I don't know, Jenna, is that correct? Your MRR, huh? ARR, ARR. So ARR, but you know, usually at Akamai, we do ARR, but we divide by 12. This is a comment from maybe a lower income, maybe for a, a school, colleagues, they can't afford to, to buy this, I mean, to use this kind of app. So that means they can use uh, Apple, that means they can use the app. So yeah. only yep. they focus or target on certain basis of uh, market. Lah. So is that good or not on a long term? Because we are talking about growth, you know, for this kind of app. Is it, I mean, it's, it's all trial, you know, on a trial stage of early stage. It, it depends if you're, like I said, um, whatever value proposition. I talked about a lot of products, stickiness, creating a product that meets the market. So if you're targeting a school market, education market, and they only use Apple, 
your development team is going to be built on base the fact that I'm only going to build Apple products or Apple applications. Um, and it's not so concerned of like scale. Um, you, you do have to worry about that because once you decide to only work on Apple, you've kind of limited your domain. But if, if in the US, like school systems where you have like mandatory platforms, it's fine because you have enough business out there. You have you know, enough schools out there they can go after. And it goes back down to the different metrics, consumers, individual users that you're counting versus businesses that you're going after and looking at revenue. I hope I, hope I answered that question. Um, I know we we're talking a lot about customer lifetime value today, um, but I also wanted to ask you about the acquisition portion. Um, so I think based on the first, I, I don't know which slide you were on, there was a growth and then there was a maturity and there was the life cycle one that's like right at the beginning, way before this. This, this one, yeah. Okay. So I'm at the early stage mm -hmm. and um, I'm just wondering, for my investors, right? Do they want, like, for marketing, is it, um, do, I, do I do per acquisition or do I put in, okay, let me rephrase it. So <laughs> I'm spending a lot of money on Google ads, I'm spending money on Facebook ads, and I don't know, they're all trial and error, so I don't know which one's gonna work, which one's gonna tick. Um, but when I present that information to the investor, is it cost per acquisition, cost per click, cost per impression? Like, which one matters? It's definitely acquisition. Uh, so, you, you know, in order to calculate your you know, customer lifetime value, it has been acquisition. If you're looking at cost per click, um, so what you do is, it's a lump sum money that you have. Let's say you have a dollar. <laughs> That's all you have, a dollar. And you dump it into Google, Google uh, AdWords, right? It's a dollar that you talk about. So if you acquire four users and the click-throughs turn into actual users, it's gonna be four divided into a dollar. So you would actually disclose that you've invested a dollar. Let's say you invested a dollar for four quarters. So it'd be four dollars that you actually invested. But you would have to give the rate of how much you're acquiring those users for. Because if the investors are saying, wow, one user costs a dollar, and that's all the money that you've dumped in, it's very expensive. So the other part is, you know how random people will click on your Facebook ad, right? Whether they're, we're, we're doing B2B, but obviously if I put it up on Facebook ad, there are a lot of B2C kind people that will click on it just because they clicked on it. Mm -hmm. That will go into my cost. That is right? true, and that is true. So. And, but they're not qualified leads. They're not, but it's the amount of investment that you've stuck in. So it's almost like an ROI calculation. It's the amount that you stuck in as a whole, right? So a dollar is what you invested. It's, it's then, that's the reason why you would calculate that average cost per user, because it, it's the average rate now, right? You, because you can't, if you'd minus out the fact that I'm a horrible consumer and I clicked on this ad, I had no interest whatsoever, it, it, you still paid it, right? Yeah. It's just unfortunately all the other subsequent users that you acquire is more expensive. Okay. Yeah. So and then it, it comes down to how I filter and yeah. test and see which avenue makes best. Correct. And and it's funny because um, you know I, I moved from B to B, B to C to back to B to B, <laughs> and one of the things I I personally don't like digital advertising for B to B. Um, if it doesn't have a, a mass market appeal, depending on what industry you're in, right? Yeah. Because you might want to think back. If you're reaching, if you feel that your B2B customers are in the, in, in the masses, it makes sense. No, right? but everybody does it. Everybody does it. Every, but every B2B I know is on Facebook. Yep, they and, do. And I don't know why. So I also try it, you know, like yeah. just follow and, the crowd. And it's experimentation. You, you learn by burning. And, I, and I'm not going to... I don't sugarcoat the fact that you should you should do it. I encourage everybody to get burnt, but you know, I, I put a the way that he mentioned uh, Junda mentioned it. I already had it in my thing. It said budget. <laughs> because it's one platform to manage, and you sell globally, except China. 
Yeah, that one helps a lot. We've, we've tried many channels, buying, buying ads on blog sites, portals, this and that. It's too much to manage. Facebook sells globally, and you can kind of target some demographics as well. Yeah. Then you realize, right, sorry. Then you realize that your Google, your Google Analytics and your Facebook Analytics is very different. So which one do you qualify? Because I have like... Just based on hip analytics, there's probably like 30, 40 clicks, but Facebook charges me like 200 clicks, and I'm like, what? Right? So which one do you qualify then? Because the numbers are so different. Uh, I think we look more at Facebook. Yeah, because Google, okay. be, you, and you have to trust Facebook first. Okay. And then because what, whatever Google is getting is based on some uh, third party or external cookie information, uh, it's not as uh, direct as from Facebook on the premise that you trust Facebook. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Not sure if that helps, but I, I do encourage people to t t trial and error. And it, you'll find you know, uh, tracking mechanisms like figuring out where cookie, creating campaign pages to land you know, where users go. You know, those are things that you, know, you experiment with to kind of figure out whether or not a real user is kicking off Facebook ads and actually going to your website and, and actually you know, doing what you want them to do, register. Right? Um, and a lot of times, um, you know, what, because, I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not sure what industry are, you want to disclose what it, B2B you're targeting, and maybe um, for the... So, hello. Yeah, okay, so the company that I'm in, we sell a recommendation engine. So, like Amazon, whatever you, you know, if you clicked on A, you might also like B or C or D. So we're a uh, recommendation engine for e-commerce. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it really depends on where you're at in your in, in, in terms of how you want to market. Like for example, at Akamai, I uh, digital spend is something that I don't encourage too much, only because IT IT owners or IT implementer product managers, if they know what they want, they don't need an ad. <laughs> you know, you're, you're better off making FaceTime, and I mentioned personal network. You're better making better off at FaceTime at a at an event that's in that area. And that's, that depends on your business. Again, if it's your B2B targeted, very specific niche, FaceTime is better than putting ads on, on the site and having people randomly click on it. Um, yeah, you know, you know, I have evil colleagues that would click on competitor ads just because they'll pay for it, right? It. Yeah. It's not to say you're evil, you know, but. <laughs> Any more questions? Hi, um, actually in this uh, business whereby we target HR professionals, uh, payroll to be specific. So when it comes to like uh, content driven, right, that's market, uh, marketed to this particular target group, how best should we actually go about it? What's the best way to actually, um, you know, aggregate content to actually target this group in terms of acquiring the, the, the customers as well as retain the customers? Sorry, can you repeat the last part? Yeah. What's the... What's the best way to actually reach out to this particular target group, the HR professionals, in order to acquire them and also to retain them as well? What kind of content do we actually need to produce to, to actually uh, you know, attract these people? So, um, based on B2B, you say? Yes, B2B. So B2B. Um, so again, it, it's specific to industry, but content, content marketing is something that's really big. So a lot of the content marketing, how it's written, assumes that readers are dumb. Um, which you can't do in this day and space where, you know, search is at your fingertips, right? You can go search for people's opinion very quickly. So the type of content that you would probably provide is how, how your, you know, how the market landscape looks and, and having that strong knowledge of that la landscape. So in her situation, I can use, uh, use that recommendation engine. If she's able to create content that talks about recommendation engine and, and be very neutral, I actually feel that you have a better chance of, of, getting, um, of getting people to believe you and have that authenticity as a startup. Because startups have a tough time. You know, vendors, vendors to big corporations, they just kick around because of the fact that I'm going to pay you, right, your master-servant type of relationship. So you, hence, you know, that's not respected. But you have to remember that product managers or IT folks that are actually purchasing your solution um, do research. They do research in a Thing. And having content that's relevant, just in general, industry landscape content, goes a long way. Um, and then, you know, as you slowly, as you slowly start building up that reputation, adding in your value prop to to the to the to the buyer, then makes a lot more sense. But at the early stage, um, it's getting into the industry because you just launched in the market. 
you should look like you guys know what you guys are talking about. Um, versus just saying, you know, my product's better than product B. You know, I'm product A, that's product B, I'm better. That's just not gonna work in this day and age, right? So it's that authenticity that you need to create with that content space. And where do you get it out? You have to get it out in the trade, in the trade um, sites. So if, if, you know, like, you have to know where, to, you basically have to sit in the, in the eyes of the product managers or IT decision makers. Where are they sourcing this information? It could be a magazine, right? They might be reading, like, for example, if you're, if you're in the media business, you look at Content Asia, for example. You would read Content Asia, get all that information. What new content's coming out this year? What content am I going to buy? Um, and then, you know, place, place your content in there in a, in a very natural way. Um, you have to remember, you would think that the bigger companies wouldn't want your content. That's not true. It's a lot of effort to create content. So f for you to create, them for, create it for them, they'll take it to open arms if it's good.